Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this symposium, Plastic Pollution in the Oceans, with special focus on the Baltic. This symposium is organized by um, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and we are delighted to co-organize this together with IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And we are very grateful to our sponsors, Postcode Stiftelsen, who provides the financial support to organize this symposium. The scientific organizing committee has consisted of Professor Emeritus Leif Andersson, who is a professor of hydrosphere sciences at Gothenburg University. Can you please rise? And um, our colleagues in the IUCN, Carl Gustav Lundin and Joao Sosa. Uh, but this idea uh, to organize a symposium for discussions about the problems with plastic pollution and what we can do about it primarily was spawned quite some time ago by my long-term colleague and uh, collaborator at Uppsala University, Lars Lundin, who is sitting in the very back there. And we have spent many hours discussing these challenges and what can possibly be done about it. And we are particularly intrigued to find out how microorganisms and enzymes may help us in this matter. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit of, ba of background about the things that raise our concerns. You, have probably seen the headlines in the media on almost a daily basis, or at least every week there is some news on plastic pollution. Here's one from last week from the Smithsonian, a bee's nest built entirely of plastic waste. And um, the day before, Americans may be ingesting enormous quantities of microplastic on a yearly basis. If that is counted in a different way, we saw the news this morning from the University of Newcastle in Australia that we eat a credit card every week. Um, a little further back, we had this headline in the British Medical Journal, Threat to Human Health. And of course, we will be discussing in this symposium also uh, health hazards arising from the plastic pollution. And if we measure the quantities, it's absolutely horrifying how much plastic ends up in the oceans on a yearly basis. And um, the health concerns are not only for us humans, but also for the many organisms living in our oceans. Here's a news item about sea scallops and what happens when the plastics end up in their system. And um, quite recently, a little more than a month ago, a report was released from uh, SAPEA, the Science Advice for Policy by the European Academies for the European Commission. And I suppose most of you have already uh, had a chance to look at this. Um, so, uh, and I, I don't even dare to show the absolutely horrible pictures of whales and seals who have been found with lots of plastic or turtles. Uh, uh, that always makes, makes me cry. Um, so what can we do about it? If we should try to look at this in a more constructive way, uh, some of the news that we have seen in the headlines the past few years is that microorganisms and enzymes can actually be harnessed to perform the job for us if we can use them in a clever way. And this is one of the things we will be discussing. Um, a news item from last fall, Finnish study to employ plastic-eating bugs in fight against marine litter. And uh, one of the scientists here, Kari Koivuranta, is in the audience. So I hope we can hear more about this. Uh, before we uh, move on to the symposium as such, let me also say uh, just a few words about the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Our aims is to promote the sciences and to strengthen their influence in society. And we reside right across the street from this building and it's built by the same architect, constructed by the same architect, so it's very much the same style. Our academy was founded way back in 1739. I think we were the fourth science academy in the world. And uh, here are some of the main characters. I'm sure you know all of these. Carl Linnaeus from Uppsala was one of, of the founding fathers, if we may say so. He was 32 years old when he founded the academy. And he was not the youngest. 
There was a group of six men, and there were two guys who were younger than him. Um, some of the most famous scientists are uh, Carl Wilhelm Scheele, who discovered eight elements, Jacob Berzelius, who discovered five elements, and it's fun to point this out this year when we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of the periodic table. And, of course, Alfred Nobel. He was also a member of the Academy. And over the years, we've had a number of Nobel laureates that were members of uh, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Father and son Siegborn, uh, Theodor Svedberg, uh, Sune Bergström and Bengt Samuelsson for the prostaglandins, Arvid Karlsson with dopamine, he passed away quite recently, and Thomas Lindahl for the repair mechanisms of DNA. And finally, let me point out what the main aims of the Academy are. We have a, a list of priorities uh, that we should focus on, and I have highlighted in red those that we comply with by organizing this symposium. We strive to provide uh, the scientific basis for policy decisions for decision makers in society, not only in politics, but also other decisions that are important for uh, our species. And we uh, want to offer good meeting places for science and for scientists by organizing conferences like this one. In the second cat category, we see that we are eager to disseminate the research results, not only to the politicians and decision makers, but also to the general public, so that they become aware of the scientific progress. And we also wish to encourage international collaborations and scientific contacts. So I'm sure we will be working very much along those lines in this um, symposium. So, without further ado, I leave the word to my colleague in the IUCN, Mina Epps, who will tell us a little bit more about um, the aims of the symposium and the IUCN. Please, Mina. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dan, for the warm welcome and for the introduction, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very delighted to see so many of you here. Um, as we know, I mean, our oceans are uh, the final destination of a lot of plastic. Um, and so, which of course is a great concern to all of us. And although much research have really focused on the faith of tracing the faith of plastic, um, not as much as really looking at this toxic effect, but this is really where we need to close. There's still significant knowledge gap, which we need to close. And what greater place to do that than at the Royal Swedish uh, Academy of Science? Uh, this is really a place that brings together, you know, renowned researchers, but also emerging researchers um, to kind of present their cutting edge science and, and research, which actually, uh, as a parenthesis, actually makes me come to think of an incident which was here in 2002. Uh, when uh, a dear friend and colleague of mine was presenting some of her early work. It was one of the first CDM projects in Eritrea. And she was here presenting, and as she was on the stage, her, her skirt split in the back. And as she was walking sideways out and handing over to her colleague, uh, there was this remarkable lady standing on the side with a needle and thread and uh, stitched her skirt back together so she could actually go back back up on stage and finish our presentation. And for me, that really, really is evident that this is a place that can actually stitch things together. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, and as I said before, I'm very eager to listen and to learn from today's presentations about the faith of plastic in the marine environment and also to look at potential bioengineer solutions. Uh, this two-day symposium is um, a, a two-year project which is funded by the Swedish Postcode Foundation. So with their generous support, we are, and in collaboration as well um, with um, the, the Swedish um, Royal uh, Academy of Science, um, looking at this. But my colleague, uh, Carl Gustav, has really been instrumental and key in actually both initiating this project uh, and, and leading it also together with our colleague uh, Joao Sosa, who, who is actually one of the co-authors of the report that you, would, that you will hear a little bit about uh, in a minute. So this is part uh, of also a greater portfolio of IUCN's work. Uh, so we are very committed to closing the tap, uh, the plastic tap. 
So um, with that, no further delay, I'd like to actually hand over to my colleague, uh, Carl Gustav, to actually say a few words about this symposium um, and beyond, I would say. Uh, and also, once again, I really look forward to being invigorated by new, new science and also to further exchange with you in the next uh, two days. So thank you very much. So, Carl Gustav, welcome. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mina. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I must say, I've always been very impressed by this museum also, so um, thank you very much for hosting us. Um, I think as a member of IUCN, it's one of those organizations that has headed many of the aspects of biodiversity conservation and protection uh, in this wonderful country. So I think many of you might wonder, do we need another plastic symposium? I mean, there's, it's all over the media. Is there anything new to tell us? And uh, the reason why we wanted to have this symposium is to really deal with two main issues. The first one is what's actually going on in the Baltic, to get a much clearer idea of the flows of plastic, how are they getting into the Baltic, which are the main actors that need to change their behavior, from the producers to the merchant level and onto the consumers. And I think we have some very interesting new data that we'll hear a little bit later uh, this afternoon. The second part, which I think is equally exciting, is to learn a little bit more about what can we do about our plastic legacy. So we've all contributed to this problem. I think we can safely say there's no one here who's actually been able to behave in a completely virtuous way. Even under the best of circumstances, it's incredibly hard to live a sort of a reduced plastic lifestyle. To have a no, no plastic lifestyle, I think, is impossible for all of us. From the moment that we're born, we have plastic surrounding us. If we think of the healthcare sector, if we think of all the steps we have in our daily lives in terms of food and so on. Now, understanding this also, I think, puts an impetus on us to see what are the solutions that we can actually find. So some of us have heard about Boran Slat. Boran came up with this fantastic idea of setting together a, a big trawler in the ocean and collect the plastic. But as we're learning, you know, only a few percent of the plastic is actually on the surface. So even on the most fantastic circumstances, you would never be able to address more than one or two percent of that problem. That's probably not going to do it for us, so we need to find other solutions. That's the reason why we're here, to think about how do we deal with the microbes that are already today able to uh, break down plastic in the ocean. Maybe there is actually a solution that helps us to get to a reduced plastic in the ocean, and it doesn't take 500 years. Now, of course, there are many challenges associated with this. The first and obvious one is that right now, we haven't found these microbes in the ocean, certainly not in the deep ocean, so there will be a significant lag until evolution kicks in and, and these uh, organisms are available. So the obvious question here is, is this something we can do to speed it up? Is this actually our opportunity to help evolution to make sure that some of these uh, genes that are producing these enzymes can actually uh, be expressed in organisms of the deep. So that's one of the important questions I think that we should ask ourselves and see if we can find a way to, to suggest how we do that. Now, as I've talked to many people in the conservation community, there's a reaction to this. The first reaction is, can this really work? The second reaction, which I think is perhaps more important to address is, so what are the biosecurity concerns of this? Does this mean that as soon as we put some plastic in the ocean, whoops, you know, it's all going to be munched up? Because, of course, we have lots of very useful plastic that are there for long periods of time. Think of your sailboat or, you know, other types of things that we are using, pipes or whatever, in the ocean that might not actually contribute to the plastic problem, but would still have issues when it comes to being digested by microbes. And what are the risks of these genes spreading across into other organisms and possibly having a detrimental effect on other aspects of, of uh, the planet? So I think we need to have that discussion and take it serious because a lot of people are very concerned about that. A second part also that I think some people are asking, so what does it take? How difficult will it be to do this? How expensive would it be? What are the types of challenges we stand? And is there a pathway to actually develop a project like this? So as I've been talking to friends who deal with freshwater treatment, 
as you know, there's primary, secondary, tertiary treatment. So we come to the uh, secondary treatment, looking at biological treatment of water. Right now, most of the plastic that isn't funneled off, which is macroplastic, but the microplastic, the nanoplastic, is essentially just washed through the system and it gets put into the waterways and eventually end up in the ocean. Is there a way of actually treating it already at the water treatment plants? Now, if we were able to do that, perhaps through skimming off the micro particles into some sort of sludge and treating the sludge, we might be able to dramatically reduce the flow of microplastics into the ocean. And as we know, half of the plastic that comes out of Sweden is actually microplastic. So this is a huge problem for us and we need to deal with it. And if we look around the Baltic, most of the Baltic countries also have issues related to um, microplastic, which are very significant. In some cases, it dwarfs the macroplastic, but overall, I think we're all heading in a direction where we know how to deal with the macro one. We haven't really found the solutions to the micro ones yet. When it comes to nanoplastic, we're certainly not there at all. And as I think, for those of you who went up early this morning and looked at Morgan Stunden and Mina Epps um, I was there in, in that one talking about what are the health effects also. We're just starting to scratch the surface of understanding where the potential risks might be. We're very far away from having any real models where we can look at what happens to nanoplastics in our bodies. And we certainly, I think, have very limited understanding of the pathways of potential pathogens that are associated with plastic coming into our bodies. So I think that's a significant healthier question that needs to be addressed in a proper way. So anyway, um, rather than me talking all day, I want to start the first um, sort of scene setter with Martin Hasseler from Department of Marine Science at uh, Gothenburg University. And he will give us a bit of a sense of what's the distribution of plastic in the marine environment and giving us a bit of a sense of what's happening, what are the trends.